Okay, Emily. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to our conference, the United States and the Greek War of Independence. And if you are joining us for the first time, we welcome you. My name is Nick Larigakis, president of the American Hellenic Institute. We had an exceptional first day of our conference yesterday, and I believe we all learned a lot from the very thorough presentations, and we are grateful for yesterday's presenters and participants. Today, we continue with our celebration of the bicentennial of Greek independence, the enduring strength of the Hellenic spirit, and the shared American and Hellenic ideas that have served as the foundation of strong U.S.-Greek relations for two centuries. We will pick up from where we left off yesterday with a panel of three presentations to expound upon these themes. I am confident we are in for an equally insightful and thought-provoking day, and I look forward to hearing from our presenters. However, before we commence with our panel, we are thrilled and excited to have with us here two very distinguished individuals who will be offering greetings. The first one will be via video, unfortunately, due to the uh, time constraints that she has in terms of her very busy schedule and of the six hour time difference. She was not able to be with us to hear live, but she did uh, uh, give us a video that we're gonna look at very shortly. And that's none other than Ambassador Iana Angelopoulos Laskalaki, somebody that is exceptionally well known and very distinguished personality throughout the world. She is a lawyer, a former parliamentarian, ambassador of the Greek state and a best-selling author. In 1996, then Prime Minister Konstantin Simitis of Greece appointed her to lead the country's successful campaign to host the 2004 Olympic Games. In 2000, when unfortunately the slow progress and gridlock bureaucracy put the Athens in danger of losing the Games, she was once again asked to assume the presidency, but this time as the, uh, as the president of the Athens 2004 Organizing Committee and ultimately saved the project. For those of us who attended the events, who participated, I for one was a volunteer there for two weeks. And those who viewed the games around the world will have to say it may be one of the best Olympiad in modern Greek history. Additionally, in 2019, and one of the reasons why she's with us here today, Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis appointed her as president of the Greece 2021 Committee for the celebrations of the 200 years since the Greek Revolution and the birth of the modern Greek state. However, the American Hellenic Institute and Ambassador Daskalaki go back a number of years where we had the opportunity to honor her here with our Hellenic Heritage Achievement Award back in 2013. And we also had the pleasure of hosting and uh, organizing three presentations in three cities for her, uh, uh, her best-selling uh, book was, was on a top 10 bestseller for the New York Times and, uh, and Wall Street Journal, My Greek Drama. No stranger to us, a good friend. It is a pleasure to now uh, have the message by Ambassador Yana Angelopoulos Daskalaki. Dear Mr. President, dear friends, Agapiti Fili, thank you for your gracious invitation to address the two-day conference organized by the American Hellenic Institute. The Greek diaspora's principal advocate and resilient campaigner in the Congress and the American administration since 1974. What a long and productive journey this has been as the currently leading team under the guidance of my dear friend, Nick Laringakis, successfully traces the inspired leadership of the AHIS historical founder, Jean Rosidis. You chose to honor the 200 years after the revolution with a discussion of eminent speakers under the theme, the United States and the Greek War of Independence, 1821. This choice, successfully brings to the table both the ancient Greek culture's influence of the founding fathers of the United States and the American Philhellenes' contribution to the Greek Revolution. Both 
the American Revolution and the Greek Revolution had as common starting point the respect for man and especially his need for freedom and self-determination. To this day, both our nations believe in these human values, which have formed the strong relations between the United States of America and Greece for two centuries. But Greek-American relations do not relate only to the past. They also represent the present and the future, as charted by our collaboration in all international military and political organizations. Our strong economic trade, and of course, through the valuable source of the Greek diaspora, whose members are prominently present at all levels of American life. For the Greece 2021 Committee, extending an invitation to the diaspora to participate in the events of 200 years after the revolution was a paramount choice from the beginning. A choice that complements with the notion of universality, our appeal for participation and collaboration in our events. It is our duty to maintain bridges of friendship and communication with all of you, our diaspora members. And we thank them and you for responding to our invitation with such enthusiasm. For the USA alone, we have received a significant number of diverse and interesting proposals for events to take place in the US and indeed Greece, not to mention also proposals for events organized by the US Embassy in Athens under the auspices of the Greece 2021 Committee. Some of the proposals submitted to the committee refer to our historical past. Others link the past with today. Then there is a third category concerning the future and relating it to the development of technology and science advancement. These three elements, past, present, future, are also part of our commemorative numismatic program. The phoenix and the first drachma represent the past and the power to adapt for the future by being reborn when times require it. The silver coins depicting the expansions of the Greek territory relate to our ability to succeed despite the mistakes and failures. And the gold coins depicting the flags, our Greek flags, symbolize but our national identity. In concluding my remarks, I wish to thank you once more for your invitation and reconfirm my admiration for you, our diaspora members, as your achievements give a strong signal to the US society at this auspicious time when we celebrate our 200 years after the revolution. We thank uh, Ambassador Angelopoulos Daskalaki uh, for taking the time and honoring us with that message. And we can wish her continued uh, good success regarding all her endeavors, regarding the celebrations for 2021 that will continue to take place over the course of the months of this year and maybe beyond depending on COVID. Uh, now, we are, of course, even more honored to have live and in person with us uh, from Athens. And joining us here via Zoom is uh, John Kisolakis, who is the Secretary General for Greeks Abroad and Public Diplomacy. But he also is the head of Greece 2021 program under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
Professor Kisolakis has taught in academic institutions in both Greece and abroad. He has worked in many European countries and in the United States, collaborating and communicating with many organiza organizations and councils of local Greek communities. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, this is the man responsible for the Greek diaspora everywhere around the world that he has to deal with. It's no small task and he keeps, he keeps busy uh, on all hours of the day and night. We become uh, close friends uh, over the course of his tenure in this position and we look to do more things together. But today we welcome him here today to offer his greetings on behalf of uh, the Greek government, the Greek foreign ministry uh, and uh, Professor Kisolakis, welcome and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nico. Thank you very much. Honorable President of the American Hellenic Institute, professors, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Athens and the Secretariat General for Greeks Abroad and Public Diplomacy of the Hellenic Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It is a great pleasure to find myself among such important scientists, professors, Greeks of the diaspora and field Hellenes. A warm thank you goes out to President Larigakis for the invitation, my good friend Nikos, but also the, for the excellent work and initiatives of the American Hellenic Institute. As the Greeks struggled for their freedom after 400 years under the Ottoman yoke, the people of America offered their generous support. Only for 45 years before the American colonies had declared their independence from Great Britain and an appeal to freedom and democracy, ideals they traced back to Greece of the classical age. So the close friendship between Greece and the United States was the product of shared ideals but also of mutual interests. The breakdown of the Ottoman Empire heralded by the Greek Revolution gave America its first experience in the role of global maritime power. The Greek Revolution became an important issue of young America's foreign policy. There were still great struggles among the American state but it was passionately believed that for democracy to stay alive and healthy, Americans had to help the Greek revolutionaries. And this is how the story of the American Philhellenes begins. The enthusiasm of the American people for the struggle of Greece was impressive as they demonstrated with gifts of money, food and weapons ship to the Greek side. There were a lot of known and less known heroes who came to Greece and sacrificed their fortune and in some cases their lives to the cause of Greek freedom. James Monroe, the president of the United States along with his administration offered the Greeks material and psychological support under the Monroe Doctrine Emissaries traveled to Greece individually and in groups to support the Greeks in their mission. One of the America's most uh, exemplary statesmen, Daniel Webster, wrote letters about the Greek Revolution and why it was so important for young America to come to the aid of Greece. Samuel Gridley Howe, a brave doctor, and uh, an abolitionist fired by enthusiasm for the Greek revolution and by the example of his idol, Lord Byron, sailed for Greece where he joined the Greek army as a surgeon. He didn't just engage in medical vow, he fought side by side with the Greeks. In 1827, he returned to the States and engaged in fundraising. He initiated what was really 
America's first foreign assistance program, medical relief and food to support the Greek revolutionaries. He was also the founder of the Napoleon Hospital. George Jarvis was one of the brightest and strongest supporters of the Greek cause of freedom. The Greek patriots were fortunate to have him as an ally along with Dr. Howe and Jonathan Miller. Jarvis battled along with Kolokotronis and his supporters during the fight at Derdenakia. These and many more examples of the American presence in the early modern Greek history led the way for an evergreen friendship. A friendship that is mutual and founded in deeply rooted democratic principles and ideals. The Greek bicentennial reminds Americans what Greece stands for. This is a wonderful opportunity for Greece to speak to the American hearts once again. It is a good time to remember the values that unite us. These values are pivotal to shaping the future of the Western civilization we are both invested in. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, uh, for your uh, comments and for participating here today. And also, we wish you uh, uh, good luck, good success with all your future projects that you undertake in regarding eight, uh, 1821 to 2021. And of course, all the other wonderful projects that you're doing regarding the Greek diaspora around the world. And now, uh, a few ground rules before I pass it on to our moderator to take you through the afternoon session. Uh, first of all, uh, for all of those who are viewing, if you have a question, and I encourage you to ask a question of our, of our speakers today, to please use the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screens to submit your, uh, your question. Uh, the moderator will not be reading extensive bios on any of our speakers uh, to save time. Everyone should have received the, uh, the, 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 uh, the very distinguished uh, bios of the speakers and the invitations that you have received from AHI. You can look at them at your convenience. Uh, and last but not least, uh, yesterday I was uh, remiss in not properly thanking Nick Karambolis, uh, one of our speakers who presented yesterday, but also our AHI board member, and who along with uh, Professor Kitarov uh, played a, 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 a very important role in outlining our two-day conference here today. And without uh, uh, Nick's uh, invaluable assistance and guidance, along with Professor Kitarov, we would not have been able to put together uh, this presentation that you have uh, been following uh, yesterday and, of course, so you will follow today. So at this point, I am pleased to say that I will not be a moderator again today. As I, had, as I had a pinch hit yesterday, unfortunately for Jim Marquetos, uh, who is uh, ill, but doing very well, and sends his regards to everyone. And at this point, I will introduce today's uh, moderator, Dr. Polivia Parara, professor here at the University of Maryland, just right outside of Washington, DC. Dr. Parara is a native of Athens, Greece. She received a BA from National and Kapodistrian University of Athens School of Philosophy with a major in history and an MA and a PhD from the University of Paris. At the University of Maryland, she teaches classes in modern Greek studies and classics. And before coming to the university, she taught courses on classics and modern Greek language, history and literature for nine years at Georgetown University. Dr. Parada presents papers in numerous international conferences on her discovery, the classical bouquet, a primary source on the reception of classics by modernity. It is indeed a pleasure to pass on the program now for her to carry it through for the rest of the afternoon to a close friend, Dr. Polivia Parada. The panel is yours. <laughs> Unmute, unmute. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
thank you, Nick, for your kind introduction and honor me by this invitation to be the moderator of the second day of the celebration <clears throat> the bicentennial of the Greek War of Independence. I'm very glad to be among very distinguished speakers today, and I will follow your guide rules <laughs> to say just a few words. Our first speaker is Dr. Alex Kiru, Professor of History and Director of the Program in East European and Russian Studies at Salem State University in Salem, Massachusetts, where he teaches on the Balkans, Byzantium, and the Ottoman Empire. His presentation today is entitled Adamandios Korais and Thomas Jefferson, the Authors of Two Revolutions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kiru. The floor is yours. Thank you, Polivia. Uh, in, in the interest of full disclosure, as the professor just noted in her introduction, which was very gracious, thank you. Uh, I need to reiterate, and I should acknowledge that, again, I am a Balkan historian who teaches on Byzantium and the Ottoman Empire, which is to say that my areas of expertise are actually far removed from the subject of Thomas Jefferson and Adamandios Corais. That said, uh, I apologize in advance for any potential deficiencies in my brief uh, 20 to 22 minute long lecture today. And I, of course, certainly welcome any corrections that the audience members might have for me uh, during our question and answer period. The great classical scholar Adamandios Corais might well be thought of as the Greek Thomas Jefferson. Like Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, the most influential of the founders of the American Republic, and the country's third president, Adamandios Corais, the intellectual father of the Greek struggle for independence, was a revolutionary who believed that nations were entitled to independence and self-rule, just as individuals were entitled to liberty and unalienable rights. Like Jefferson, Corais worked to establish the social and political ideals of the Enlightenment in his emerging nation. Both of these men were the veritable authors of their respective nations' respective revolutions. It is a testament to their remarkably similar vital roles in the lives of their nations that circumstances would bring these two men together to form a connection, a connection which would have lasting significance for both America and Greece. By way of background, Corais was born in Asia Minor's great historic Greek port city of Smyrna in 1748, seven years after Jefferson had been born in Virginia. Adamandios was born to Ioannis Corais, a Hiot by origin and leading Smyrniot entrepreneur, and Thomaevi Risia, a native Smyrniot and daughter of Adamandios Risios, a wealthy businessman and devotee of Greek letters. At a very early age, Adamandios showed signs of genius and an insatiable love of learning, which were encouraged by both his parents. Although Ioannis Corais, like most Greeks living under Ottoman rule, had been deprived of an education, he was an avid admirer of, of learning and eagerly provided his son, Adamandios, with the resources for formal schooling and private teachers. The most influential of these teachers was a Dutchman, Bernard Kuhn, who taught Adamandios Latin and Dutch, while Adamandios also began his eventual mastery of English, French, Hebrew, and Italian. Adamandios also benefited significantly from the legacy of his maternal grandfather, whose rare personal library became a treasure trove for Corais' intellectual curiosity. As a young man, Corais worked alongside his father, in their family's silk business, but he soon found commercial life unsatisfying, intruding as it did on his true love, study, and learning. Nonetheless, in 1772, at the age of 24, Adamandios was sent by his father to establish a branch of the family business in Amsterdam, the then preeminent center of international commerce and trade. The next six years Corais spent in Amsterdam changed his life forever. When he was not engaged in trade, Corais immersed himself in the vibrant intellectual and cultural life of Amsterdam, deepening his study of languages and philosophy. Corais's experience of freedom and education in Holland 
which stood in stark contrast to the tyranny and ignorance which his countrymen endured under Ottoman rule, bred in him a deep conviction that the Greek people must free themselves from Turkish oppression. Koraïs also concluded that before the Greeks could liberate themselves from Turkish rule and establish an, an independent national state, they would have to emancipate themselves through education and moral regeneration. In other words, they would have to eliminate, as Koraïs saw it, from their cultural life, the corrupting Ottoman influences that had penetrated and subverted the Greeks' leadership, institutions, and attitudes. Koray saw education. He saw education as the source of that moral rejuvenation, a moral rejuvenation predicated upon intellectual awakening, an awakening which would have to precede the inevitable political revolution against Turkish tyranny. Only in this way would the Greek people, degraded as they were after centuries of Ottoman occupation, become adequately prepared and equipped to succeed in their goal of creating not only an independent Greek state, but a happy, just, and moral Greek society. Koraïs's ideas and subsequent work were next influenced by his move to France. After repatriating from Amsterdam to Smyrna for four years, Koraïs, who could no longer tolerate the humiliation of life under Turkish rule, returned to Europe in 1782 and trained as a physician for six years at France's most prestigious school of medicine at the University of Montpellier. Driven by his boundless intellect, while Corais pursued his medical training, he also resumed his study of languages and philosophy. He began publishing scholarly works and he was soon recognized as one of Europe's leading authorities of classical studies. In 1788, Upon completion of his medical training, Corais settled in Paris. Within a year of his arrival, the French Revolution began. And instead of a career in medicine, Corais was swept up in the radical political changes which shook France, becoming in the process a man of letters and the preeminent literary harbinger of Greek Revolution. Seeing firsthand how the spread of education in France gave birth to the love of liberty, Corais resolved to work to the best of his abilities as a writer and scholar for the education of his fellow Greeks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Corais undertook to remake his countrymen, to awaken them to the significance of their heritage, to elevate their cultural and historical knowledge, to, to prepare them for freedom and self-rule. With the financial support of wealthy diaspora Greeks, the revolutionary French government, and later Napoleon, Corais edited, among other works, the celebrated Hellenic Library, a highly influential series of the classics in modern Greek translation published between 1805 and 1827 in 16 primary volumes and 13 secondary volumes. After the completion of this colossal project, he published the first modern Greek dictionary. Corais was one of Europe's first intellectuals to recognize the crucial connection between a literary language and nationhood. This awareness led Corais to place language at the center of his efforts for Greek enlightenment. Consequently, he was a strong proponent of a standardized written language, Katharevosa. Katharevosa, cleansed of foreign elements, as close to classical Greek as possible, and balance between elegance and precision to overcome what Corais saw as the parochial divisions and deficiencies of vernacular Greek. Although Corais's advocacy of Katharevos would of course produce its share of problems, his linguistic innovations would have an enormous and constructive influence on modern Greek language and literature. Corais's efforts were not limited to influencing, to influencing only his countrymen. He made use of his scholarly connections and the respect that he enjoyed as an accomplished classicist to promote the Greek cause among Western Philhellenes. And this fact may explain why Adamandios Corais and Thomas Jefferson met in Paris. While the former Corais 
already again by that time a renowned classical scholar was studying medicine and punk at Montpelier and later, and the latter, excuse me, Jefferson, was serving as the United States ambassador to France, a post he held from 1784 to 1789. Jefferson and Corais met in 1785. Little is known about this private encounter or a subsequent meeting and, and shared dinner, other than the fact that both men attributed their acquaintance to a mutual friend, John Paradise, Ioannis Paradisis. A Greek expatriate entrepreneur with residences in London and Paris, John Paradise, whose wife, Lucy Ludwell Paradise, was an American from Jefferson's native Virginia, enjoyed a very close friendship with Thomas Jefferson. This friendship, evidenced in a substantial correspondence of some 80 letters, both delighted and enlightened Jefferson, who actually learned pronunciation of modern Greek from his friend, Paradise. Jefferson's interest in Greek, classical and modern, was a lifelong fascination. Jefferson's childhood education had imbued him with a deep reverence for Greek language and civilization. Peter Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's father, helped shape his son's interest in classical studies and Philhellenism. At his father's urging, Thomas, at the age of nine, began studying Greek and Latin. As a classics student at the College of William and Mary, Jefferson was known to carry his beloved Greek grammar textbook quite literally everywhere he went. Jefferson's admiration of Greek thought and democratic ideas increased as their practical value became more and more evident to him, especially in the years leading to the outbreak of the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence. Indeed, Jefferson viewed Greek philosophy, literature, and history as the foremost sources of moral and political guidance, as matchless practical preparation for good government and for good civic life. Now, Although it's impossible, of course, to divine with any certainty at all the content of their conversations in Paris, it is reasonable to posit, given Jefferson's and Corais's mutual admiration and common interest, that these two students of classical Greece, these gentlemen of the Enlightenment, these two democratic revolutionaries must have discussed their philosophical and political thoughts and must have discussed Greece. What is clear is that nearly 40 years after their first meeting, Jefferson and Corais engaged in a brief yet weighty exchange of letters about Greece's political future. In the summer of 1823, two years after the start of the Greek Revolution, Corais wrote his first letter, penned in French, which would be followed by two more letters and gifts of books to Jefferson. Now in his 70s, Corais was too old to join the revolutionaries fighting for independence from the Turks, but he continued to work tirelessly from Paris. He worked to raise international awareness of and support for the Greek cause. After the provisional revolutionary Greek government turned to Corais for advice, he himself in turn wrote to Jefferson for his counsel on how best to organize a future Greek state. Corais had great admiration for the establishment of the American Republic, which he saw as the closest modern realization of the ancient Greeks' ideal of democracy. And he regarded his old acquaintance, Jefferson, as the chief author of that American political miracle. Corais in his letter also appealed to Jefferson to lend his great stature and influence for the Greeks' cause by publicly expressing his political support for the Greek Revolution and urging American intervention on behalf of the Greeks. Jefferson responded to Corais in the fall of 1823 in a letter written in English and dated October 31, Jefferson propounded that although the world owed Greece an eternal debt of gratitude, and despite Americans' great sympathy for the Greek struggle, the United States government could not interfere in European affairs. 
expressing both support for the Greek cause of liberty and simultaneously restraint against direct involvement in the Greek revolt, Jefferson wrote the following, quote, no people sympathize more feelingly than ours with the sufferings of your countrymen. None offer more sincere and ardent prayers to heaven for their success. And nothing indeed but the fundamental principles of our government never to entangle us with Europe could restrain our generous youth from taking some part in this holy cause. Possessing ourselves the combined blessings of liberty and order, we wish the same to other countries and to none more than yours, which the first of civilized nations presented examples of what man should be. In the same letter, Jefferson discussed in considerable length the central principles of the American Constitution, the value of the multiple state constitutions, and the organization and function of the federal and state systems, emphasizing the importance of the separation and balance of powers across government. Uh, albeit clearly earnest, there was considerable irony in Jefferson's sage exhortations. After all, Jefferson's basic premises of government were essentially modern adaptations of ancient Greek principles. Ancient Greek principles that Korais knew well and had, in fact, elaborated on in his introduction to Aristotle's ethics. One of the volumes in the Hellenic Library series, a copy of which, incidentally, was sent to Monticello with Korais's first letter. It should not surprise us that Jefferson, immersed throughout his life in classical studies, was deeply influenced by Greek thought, which he looked to, again, for practical political guidance and statecraft. Despite the conventional view that Jefferson was influenced primarily, if not exclusively, by Enlightenment thinkers such as Diderot, Rousseau, and Voltaire, his writings do not contain a single quotation from these French writers. Instead, Jefferson's writings emphasize and draw extensively from Greek philosophers. Jefferson's seemingly original seismic concept of the pursuit of happiness, for instance, which in the Declaration of Independence, we all know he identified as a fundamental unalienable human right. This concept is merely a reflection of Epicurean philosophy tempered by Stoicism in Aristotle's earlier writings. This is not a modern American innovation. Jefferson understood it for what it was, an ancient Greek idea. Nevertheless, Jefferson's commentaries on American constitutional democracy had a profound influence on Corais's thinking, affirming by practical example, his already well-formed political ideas. Jefferson's specific observations on rule of law, representational government, restraint of state power, fundamental rights, individual liberty, and other lessons from American democracy, all of these things were clearly evident in Corais' subsequent writings. Corais' commanding presence as the Greek revolution's preeminent intellectual ensured that his ideas would not be ignored Greece's, as Greece's emerging new order took shape. Indeed, through Corais's influence, many of the principles of American democracy were enunciated in the Greek constitution of 1827, a document of magisterial scope and conceptual brilliance. In 1976, concurrent with the bicentennial of the American Declaration of Independence and the approaching 150th anniversary of the Greek Constitution of 1827, Professor Andrew S. Horton of George Mason University observed the following about Jefferson Corais and the American and Greek Constitutions. He wrote, quote, had Jefferson lived another year, he would have seen the realization of his desire to be of help to the Greek constitutional committees. Corais's influence on many of the members of these committees was quite strong that he often urged the delegates to study Jefferson's ideas and the American constitutions was not empty praise for a distant acquaintance. The direct triumph of many of Jefferson's and therefore America's principles was the Greek constitution of 1827, 
the most liberal, this most liberal constitution affirms the right of democratic sovereignty and the creation of a legislature independent of the executive, but elected by the people. The Bill of Rights, closely modeled on the American document, guaranteed all of the familiar rights suggested by Jefferson, as well as the illegality of slavery and nobility." End quote. Albeit exemplary, the 1827 Constitution was never fully implemented before it was suspended by Greece's president, Ioannis Kapodistrias. Because of the breakdown of Greek society into violent factionalism and chaos in the midst of the revolution, Kapodistrias was forced to suspend the Constitution. These events unfortunately seem to confirm Correis' fears that a political revolution would not secure the Greeks' aspirations if, if it were not preceded by a cultural, intellectual, and moral revival sufficient to produce mature political leadership and a far-sighted citizenry. Moreover, the European great powers who presided over the formalization of Greece's independence in 1832 these powers were hostile to democracy. They imposed a foreign monarchy on the newly independent state. And in so doing, they crushed any possibility of restoring the 1827 constitution. Unlike his friend, Jefferson, Corais did live long enough to see the liberation of a small part of the Greek world from the Turks. And he also lived long enough to see the enormous difficulties that newly independent Greece faced, not the least of which was an absolutist monarchy unrestrained by a national constitution. Nonetheless, the importance of the 1827 document was not erased. The political principles and philosophical ideals advanced by both Jefferson and Corais manifested in the 1827 constitution would continue to resonate with if not always be practiced by Corais's countrymen long after his death in 1833. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kiru. And now we continue with the second speaker, Dr. Maureen Centelli. Professor uh, uh, Maureen Centelli is an associate professor at Northern Virginia Community College. Her recent book, The Greek Fire, American Ottoman Relations and Democratic Fervor in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Age of Revolutions, examines the rise of philellenism in the United States and how the movement influenced both foreigner and domestic policies during the early American Republic. Her presentation today is entitled American Philelines, 1827-1830, Motivation and Accomplishments. The floor is yours. Thank you. You're welcome. Frustrated with the government's unwillingness to aid or recognize Greek independence, American constituents began to write letters to their congressmen. Support for the Greeks was so intense that members of Congress began to reply in earnest, but in so doing held firm to neutrality. Lewis Williams of North Carolina wrote his constituents in April 1822, stating that although he hoped the Greeks, the most renowned people of antiquity, both in arts and in arms, would be successful in the revolution from the Ottoman Empire, the United States, however, would not be the country to provide aid. A few years later in 1825, Congressman Williams continued to defend the government's decision not to officially support Greek independence by observing that it must be satisfactorily to behold Russia taking an interest in their defense. Joseph Gist, a congressman from South Carolina, did not even offer his constituents hope for other resources of aid to Greece, but simply apologized with, I pray to God that she may be restored to her ancient liberties in a tenfold degree and become one of the republics of the world. Still another congressman from Tennessee, Robert Allen, wrote to his constituents explaining that the House of Representatives supported the heroic struggle of the Greeks, but prudence pointed out many objections to a legislative act that could be construed into anything like an interference in the internal concerns of other nations. Rather than diffusing the popular support for the Greeks, 
congressional inaction helped spread American Philhellenism at the local level and inspired new groups of people, both men and women, to join. The American Philhellenic movement emerged as a fully defined entity separate from its European counterpart by 1824 and enjoyed popular support on a national scale. Though like any movement, interest in the Greek revolution ebbed and flowed. There is evidence of consistent support for the Greek cause, especially in the more urban areas of the United States throughout the 1820s. Greek Relief Society leaders, especially Matthew Carey of Philadelphia and Edward Everett of Boston, continue to encourage and organize support from the public by connecting the Greek war to the American Revolution. In order to continue expanding national support, however, Philhellenic leaders began to alter the focus of the Greek cause to encompass a benevolence element where aid would be raised for civilians instead of the Greek army. This expanded appeal made participation in the movement an especially appropriate outlet for women. There are a number of reasons for why this transition of sending aid to civilians took place. On the one hand, Philhellenic leaders perceived that they would more likely be able to engage a broader base of interest, especially from women, if they directed their efforts towards the Greek populace rather than the military. There is also evidence, on the other hand, that American agents in the Mediterranean directed members of the Monroe and Adams administration to, to, excuse me, to discourage public support of the Greek army if they desired to successfully negotiate a trade agreement with the Ottoman Empire. With this in mind, President Monroe and later President Adams advocated for neutrality in the Greek Revolution in favor of advancing a strategic foreign policy. John Quincy Adams, while Secretary of State, certainly made it known to pro-Greece members of Congress that the executive branch would not support their foreign policy plans. With Everett's close connections to government officials, it is possible that the government's wishes that Philhellenic societies redirect their efforts towards civilian relief helped shape the American Philhellenic movement in the final years of the war. Instead of merely relying upon Philhellenic rhetoric to inspire citizens to donate funds and supplies to the Greek troops, Philhellenes turned their attention to Greek civilians, especially Greek women and children displaced by the war. Greek committees spearheaded this effort as they collected supplies, sponsored American volunteers to the Greek army, and even later sent and financially supported agents to Greece. Benevolent societies and community charity groups frequently centered around local churches were popular, especially among elite and middle-class Protestant women in both the Northern and Southern states by the early 19th century. Dedication to Christianity and family justified participation in the civic and political affairs of local communities. With Philhellens actively requesting the participation of church societies, along with local ministers, uh, local ministers blessing the Greek cause as an appropriate Christian charity, women quickly became involved. Enthusiasm for ancient Greece entwined with dedication to the Greek cause led to a global outreach for social and religious reform. Perceiving the Muslim Ottoman Turks as the ultimate tyrants, female benevolent societies increasingly organized their efforts toward the aid of Greece. Ultimately, while early Americans donated time, money and supplies to aid the Greek cause, the goal was to provide relief to a Christian population and affect an independent Greek Republic. Lord Byron's death increased public interest in providing support for the Greek cause. Many Greek committees published and distributed pamphlets that promoted the campaign. Newspapers reported that the Greek Fund of New York alone had sent its first contributions in the amount of $6,000 in the early summer and $5,000 more by August. And we have to remember that, that that sum sounds like a lot in 2021, but we have to remember that that's $5,000 and $6,000 in the early 1820s, which would have been an astronomical amount of money. Though Lord Byron was not an American, he was a symbol of the transatlantic Philhellenic movement. In addition to his poetry, Byron's sacrifice represented a noble and virtuous gesture. While most Americans did not wish to emulate him literally, they felt inspired to at least support the Greek cause through donations. Lord Byron's Philhellenism and his service in the Greek army inspired a number of Americans to contribute more than money and supplies. 
George Jarvis was the first American volunteer in the Greek army. Jarvis was the son of a New York merchant who had established himself in Denmark. After receiving his father's permission, both father and son appeared before the American consul in Hamburg in order for the young Jarvis to acquire the appropriate papers. In April, 1822, George Jarvis arrived in Greece and officially entered into the service of the Greeks. Named a general in the Greek army, he served for the duration of the war only to die of an illness in 1828. While alive, he kept the Boston Greek Fund Committee informed of the Greek successes and setbacks. The Boston Greek Fund Committee sponsored other Americans in Greece, including Jonathan Peckham Miller of Vermont and Samuel Gridley Howe of Massachusetts. Miller was a veteran of the War of 1812 and had attended the University of Vermont prior to his service in Greece. It was Byron's death that inspired young Miller to present himself as a volunteer to the Boston Committee. Samuel Gridley Howe, a member of a well-established Boston family, was a recent graduate of Harvard in medicine. Also influenced by Byron's Philhellenism, Howe desired to follow the heroic poet's footsteps. Assuring his father that he desired medical and surgical experience on the battlefield, Howe arrived in Greece in early 1825. These three Americans reported regularly to the Boston Committee. Their letters were printed and reprinted in newspapers across the country, providing invaluable information on the status of the Greek cause to the American public. The correspondence received from these three men kept the Greek Revolution in the public eye, providing updates on civilian and military needs. In March of 1825, the first news from Jonathan Peckham Miller arrived and was quickly printed in the Boston newspapers. A note of explanation from the Boston Greek Committee was printed alongside Miller's letter, stating that he had left for the Mediterranean as a sort of agent for the committee itself. The Boston Committee had appropriated a portion of their funds to help Miller with his passage to the Mediterranean and to assist him with the costs he would incur upon arrival. The newspaper admitted that these letters are now published in the belief that they may prove interesting to the friends of Greece and the community at large. American volunteers also played an important part in mobilizing the American Philhellenic movement into humanitarian relief for Greek civilians. Upon arriving in Greece, Miller observed that the Greek soldiers had been fighting all summer and were now coming to their commander to beg bread to keep them alive. But such is the sight to which my eyes are every hour witness. Miller concluded his letter with, may you gentlemen and my beloved country continue to receive the smiles of heaven and exhort the friends of liberty in America to remember Greece. Miller's description of the starving Greeks conveyed several points to his fellow Americans. That an American presence was needed in Greece and the need for American assistance remained. Miller also reported that European Philhellens in Greece was less devoted than their American counterparts to the Greek cause, which would have played on American pride and encouraged continued support. Stories about the pitiable circumstances the Greeks found themselves in compelled American audiences to adjust their thinking toward the Greek cause. Rather than solely focusing on military assistance, humanitarian aid might go further in helping secure Greek independence. Miller's correspondence concentrated on humanitarian relief by appealing for donations of money and supplies. For the next several years, Miller and his countrymen in arms unfailingly reminded American Philhellens at home we would exhort the friends of Greece in America to exert themselves for the suffering people, remembering that the struggle is not yet over. Miller's letters continue to carry this same message for the next several years, relaying, relaying the situation in Greece, while also reminding supporters that their exertions had no relation either to war or pirates, but are made to clothe the naked and feed the hungry, to snatch from famine its victim, to administer to the necessities of decrepit old age and to save youth and beauty from a premature grave. This pleading reminder became increasingly crucial by 1826 when enthusiasm in America for the Greek cause began to plateau. An important setback the Greeks sustained was inflicted upon them by an American shipbuilding company with connections to the Greek Committee of New York. By the height of the controversy, the shipbuilders billed the Greeks for several hundred thousand dollars more than the Greek deputies were initially quoted. They were trying to purchase two ships from this American shipbuilder. 
For the Greek agents, this revelation was a disaster. And this proved to be a national embarrassment that incited public outrage and rejuvenated momentum for the Greek cause. In the midst of the Greek frigate controversy, it was, as it was called, news arrived that the Greek army had lost control of Missolonghi, a center for the Greek army, as well as the seat of provisional Greek government at the time. The American public associated Missolonghi with Lord Byron's death and had followed the military action there for more than two years. By the spring of 1826, when Missolonghi fell to the Ottomans, the city had become a symbol of the Greek War of Independence and was a focal point of Philhellenic sentiment in both Europe and the United States. Through the efforts of Matthew Carey and Edward Everett, the Greek Fund Committees of Philadelphia and Boston enjoyed a successful partnership in the final years of the war, while also nurturing Philhellenic enthusiasm within their own respective communities. Matthew Carey assumed leadership of the Philadelphia Greek Fund in January 1827 and reinvigorated the committee through public appeals made through newspapers and pamphlets. Edward Everett continued to co correspond with George Jarvis, Samuel Gridley Howe, and Jonathan Miller and made news provided to him from, Greeks, from Greece public. Samuel Gridley Howe and Jonathan Miller both returned to the United States on separate occasions in 1828, specifically to raise funds for Greek civilians traveling to both New York and Boston for speaking engagements. Howe explained he had witnessed the suffering of Greek civilians firsthand and relayed these experiences to a meeting of the New York Greek Committee early in 1828. In the last few years of the war, Howe relayed that the men had the best fate. They, had generally, they were generally massacred on the spot, though often with torments, Many have had sharp pointed stakes driven through the, their whole length of their body. The women are put to death, or if beautiful, are sold to some rich Turks. And what of the Greek civilians who had managed to survive? Why, one half of the inhabitants of the Peloponnese and Romalia have taken refuge in the mountains, Howe explained. And the situation of many of these refugees, principally women and children, is indeed deplorable and not to be conceived of by comparison with any misery as seen in this country. I could tell you of families with no other shelter than the shade of an olive tree, of emaciated, half famished orphans who go round to pick up the most offensive substances for food. A portion of Howe's address to the Greek committee was printed and circulated among their subscribers, asking clergy especially to include Howe's remarks in their Sunday sermons in order to generate donations for the cause. Newspapers and pamphlets, primarily in New York and New England, reported on Howe's efforts, calling on readers to assist in putting together a cargo that will feed and clothe thousands of hungry and naked Greek, Greek refugees. Howe's efforts were also supported by Jonathan Miller, who continued to send reports to the larger Greek committees in New York, Boston, and Philadelphia concerning the ongoing need for civilian relief. In one of these reports, Miller emphasized the important contribution American Philhellenes had made, noting that Greek bishops had ordered prayers to be said publicly for the blessing of Almighty God to rest upon these Americans who at the distance of 5,000 miles have not forgotten their fellow beings in the hour of greatest need. Howe wrote to the New York Greek Committee that with the help of Jonathan Miller and George Jarvis, they traveled around Greece and its islands, dispersing aid providing American, uh, excuse me, dispersing aid provided by these American Philhellens. In one case, the three American Philhellens were greeted by about 5,000 who received us with shouts of joy. How often did I wish, he continued, the charitable donors could have witnessed the gratitude of these poor wretches. It would be impossible to hear the story and see the general distress of each individual without shedding tears. Both Miller and Howe were so devoted to aiding Greek refugees that they even adopted Greek boys and brought them to the United States to be raised and educated. Miller's adopted son, Lucas Miltiades Miller, later became a congressman from Wisconsin. Howe's adopted son was John Zakos, who became an author, educator, and abolitionist. While it was the organizational efforts of men as such as Carey, Everett, Miller, and Howe that quickly transformed the Philhellenic movement into a nationally engaged humanitarian endeavor, the role of women played in responding to their calls for donations must also be examined. 
Female church groups and community relief societies, especially, answered the call for charitable assistance for the Greeks, becoming part of the driving force behind the Philhellenic movement in the late stage of the war. Benevolence joined with the Philhellenic cause, providing women an avenue for ex extending their influence from local communities to the international stage. From 1827 to the early 1830s, women served a central role in the American movement for Greek relief. In many localities where a Greek committee existed, there is convincing evidence to suggest that women were the driving force behind collecting subscriptions and coordinating efforts for the Greek cause. And in some cases even went door to door to collect these uh, contributions. Women's involvement in providing relief for the Greeks continued longer than most other Philhellenic organizations in the United States, many of them remaining active after 1827 when Britain, France, and Russia aided the Greeks in securing victory at Navarino. American women understood that while the war might be coming to an end, Greek civilians would continue to require assistance. Ladies groups primarily directed their efforts at gathering food and clothing for the Greek civilians. Ladies of Providence, Rhode Island and surrounding communities alone produced over 3,000 items of clothing, which were sent to the New York Committee. In Hartford, women advertised they were collecting subscriptions in order to purchase material for clothing and provisions. In Boston, a meeting of ladies designated four places of deposit or articles of money um, and clothing could be uh, given for the contributions to the Greeks. Even in smaller communities, such as Canandaigua, New York, local ladies set to work with their needles in making clothing for the Greek women and children. A resolution from Baltimore stated that it was the duty of the ladies of the United States to depart from that retired circle in which a judicious state of society requires the ladies of this country usually move and use the influence which is allotted them in, relieve, in relieving from starvation the suffering females of a foreign land whose sons and husbands are fighting the battles of the cross against the crescent. The Greek cause gave American women permission to become more publicly active. Among the successes of this Baltimore-based relief society was a ladies' fair, which raised $1,700 for the cause. And that's just the fair all by itself. In fact, one article written on the success of the ladies' fair pointed out that the women of Baltimore had far outdone their male counterparts and that men should be ashamed of their lethargy. In their final years of fighting for independence, Greece received a tremendous amount of supplies and philanthropic interest from both male and female Philhellens. Although Edward Everett was never successful in obtaining an appointment to Greece as he so desired, uh, he did, however, assist in keeping the Greek Revolution an ever-present issue in Washington through proposals printed in his own publication, the North American Review. Everett was also instrumental in highlighting the adventures of George Jarvis, Jonathan Miller, and Samuel Gridley Howe as a means of favorably discussing American support for the war and the Greek civilian population. Due to the shift from a romantic and sentimental support to an activist support of the Greek Revolution, Americans began to transfer their attention to assistance for the Greek civilian population. Confronted with reports of the realities of the conflict, especially from Americans serving in the Greek army, American Philhellenes not only used traditional Philhellenic rhetoric, but also increasingly employed benevolence rhetoric in their public appeals in order to expand their base of support. Charitable activism in support of the Greeks later inspired and became a part of future conversations on reform. These movements included abolitionism and women's reform with David Walker, William Lloyd Garrison, and Emma Willard, who's an advocate for Greek education, using the Greek cause to advance their arguments. Thank you very much. Oh, I think you're still muted. <laughs> Dr. Santelli for this very interesting uh, presentation. And now we move to our third and last uh, speaker, Dr. Van Kutudakis, Professor Emeritus of Political Science and Dean Emeritus of the College of Arts and Sciences, Indiana University, Purdue University. Professor Kutudakis also is Rector Emeritus at the University of Nicosia in Nicosia, Cyprus. And his presentation today is entitled America and the Greek State from 1830 and Beyond. 
The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I want to thank Nick and Emily for organizing this discussion on the 200th anniversary of Greek independence. 1821 is an important date for Greek Americans, but also an important date for this country's history because of the American involvement in the Greek struggle for independence. We as Americans of Greek descent have a special responsibility to celebrate the historic ties of our two countries, ties that predate the presence of the Greek American community and the extensive bilateral relations that developed in the aftermath of World War II. Unfortunately, most Greeks, let alone Greek Americans, are not aware of the early American involvement in Greece, nor have they ever visited the historic first cemetery of Athens, where many of the Americans of the American Philhellenes are buried. In cities like New York, Washington, and Boston, you see the impact of Greek art and history on our public buildings. The impact of Greek philosophy is evidenced in the democratic heritage of this country, is reflected in the writings of our founding fathers and in the sacred halls of our recently desecrated Capitol building. Our founding fathers were Philhellenes. They were educated in the classics and history. Unfortunately, the classics and history have now been, are, are fast disappearing from today's American curriculum. The founding fathers were realists, recognizing the interests and the limits of American power. The United States after 1815 realized the importance of trade in the Eastern Mediterranean and in the Ottoman Empire. Thus its support was extended to the Greek revolution objectives and the brave Greek political and military leaders. However, uh, how, despite the promises and expectations we had from President Monroe, the reality was that American political action was stymied by the Monroe Doctrine and congressional fears of getting involved in a European conflict. Consequently, the burden of assisting the Greeks fell on relief committees, individuals and organizations at the local and state level across the United States. American volunteers began arriving in Greece soon after the start of the Revolutionary War. Their testimonials and accounts provide unique insights on the Greek struggle for independence the social and economic conditions in Greece, atrocities like the massacre in Chios, but also the debate on the political future of Greece. Most American observers question the motives of European involvement in shaping the future of Greek political institutions. Yesterday, my colleagues presented uh, information about American Philhellenes and their role in the Greek independence struggle. I'm only going to make some brief comments about some of them. The Greek struggle attracted a wide range of individuals from well-meaning people and professionals to adventurers. Eventually, American evangelical missionaries came to Greece because they saw opportunities to create and quote a new Christian Greece. This became the task of people like Pliny, Fisk, and Levy Parsons of the American-based Commissioners for Foreign Missions. They used Beirut and Malta as their base of operations. Among the American missionaries who came to Greece, Reverend Jonas King and, Jonas, and, and John Hill, who came with his wife, Fanny Frances Hill. They focused on educating Greek children, particularly female children. The school set up by the hills in Plaka, which by the way still exists today, remains the oldest private school in Greece. In contrast to Hill, Reverend King spent a lot of time proselytizing. Inevitably, he ran into legal trouble 
with the Orthodox Church and the Greek authorities. He was tried and convicted in a sensational trial resulting in the intervention of the United States government to reduce King's sentence. King also ran into trouble with the Greek authorities over the money he demanded for the expropriation of some of his land property as Athens was developing as a city. Uh, again, the US government intervened on his behalf. King also recruited Greek boys to go to school in the US, particularly in Amherst. Many became teachers of Greek and also became missionaries who returned to Greece. King's successor in Athens was Michael Kalakothakis, who organized the evangelical church in Greece. The friction with the Orthodox Church over evangelical proselytizing continues. Only in recent years, with legislative changes in Greece, the issue of proselytizing has become has somewhat abated. It is an issue that remains an irritant in bilateral relations. The US annual reports on, on religious freedom continue to criticize Greece over its restrictions on proselytizing activities. The first US consul to Greece arrived in 1836. He was one of the missionary Greek recruits by the name of Gregory Perdikaris. He was born in Veria in Northern Greece and was sent to Boston by the Boston Greek Committee in 1826. In contrast, the independent Greek state was represented only by consular personnel in various US port cities. The first Greek, uh, Greek ambassador to Washington was a well-known political, literary, and diplomatic figure. He was Alexandros Rizos Rangavis. A US ambassador was also appointed to Athens at the same time. Rangavis came to Washington after the Civil War in 1867. His policy priorities in his short service in Washington included acquiring vessels for the Greek Navy, promoting the cause of, for the liberation of Crete, countering Ottoman Turkish propaganda over the issue of Crete, and expanding economic ties between the United States and Greece. These have been familiar themes in US-Greek relations since then. For most of the 19th and early 20th century, there were no major developments in bilateral relations. Greece was preoccupied with the pursuit of the Megali Ithea and the country's economic problems, while, while the United States, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> while the United States was involved in the Civil War, reconstruction, and the establishment of American predominance in the Western Hemisphere. The early Greek emigrants faced discrimination and struggled for survival in an alien Anglo-Saxon society. They were also affected by the political developments in Greece. Divisions between monarchists and Danizelis created major divisions in the emerging Greek-American community during the first quarter of the 20th century. Our government, despite the limitations of the Monroe Doctrine, followed the Balkan Wars and the Greco-Turkish conflict very carefully. That conflict raised issues of humanitarian assistance to Greece and refugee assistance, particularly from the private sector. Prior to the Asia Minor disaster in 1922, the United States government and the press were quite aware of the persecution against Greeks, Armenians, and other Christian minorities in Turkey. The reports came from journalists, diplomats, and missionaries, and also representatives of American tobacco and other enterprises operating in Turkey at that time. There, was also, there were also reports coming from the US Naval Squadron operating the Black Sea during World War, II, World War I. Despite these reports, our government failed to intervene. Instead, Washington followed Admiral Bristol's advice. Bristol was the US High Commissioner in Constantinople during World War I. 
He favored the development of, of American ties with the Ataturk regime in order to safeguard and promote long-term American business interests in Turkey. Consequently, aid to the persecuted Christian minorities came from private American uh, foundations and private sources. This was, the, I'm sorry, uh, this was an early case where human rights were subordinated to economic, to economic considerations, a kind of a familiar theme in US-Greek relations since then. The US, much like Greece, entered World War I late. US domestic politics limited the American role in the post-World War I settlement. Once again, humanitarian issues, refugee resettlement and aid, as well as immigration were the primary focus in US-Greek relations in the first quarter of the 20th century. This time period also proved important for the Greek American community. We have a significant influx of Greek emigrants along with the emergence of Greek community institutions. This included the organization and consolidation of the Orthodox Church under the leadership of Archbishop Athenagoras who in 1948 became the Greek Orthodox Patriarch in Istanbul with support from President Truman. World War II and its aftermath had a significant impact on the relations of Greece with the US, but also on the Greek American community. The prestige of the Greek American community rose with the Greek victories in World War II and the role of the community in the various bond drives in this country. Until the spring of 1947, however, Greece had been a British area of political and military responsibility. This was confirmed by the October 1944 percentages agreement initialed by Churchill and Stalin in their Moscow meeting. The so-called percentages agreement raised objections in Washington as it predetermined the future of liberated Europe despite earlier Allied proclamations. The settlement of World War II did not change the boundaries of Northern Greece. It actually brought American warnings to Greece about any attempt to change the Balkan status quo through rumored Greek military action, particularly against Albania. Washington supported the 1948 Treaty of Paris that transferred the Dodecanese Islands from Italy to Greece, but rejected Turkish claims given that Turkey was not a party to that treaty. The collapse of British power in the Eastern Mediterranean was confirmed by the proclamation of, of the Truman Doctrine in March 1947. From that point on, Greece became an American area of responsibility. The US managed the Greek Civil War and the political and economic instability in Greece well into the late 1950s. The US also directed appeals to the United Nations on the Greek Civil War. Greece and Turkey were brought into NATO in 1952, uh, despite objections by European members. Washington also signed military cooperation agreements with both countries, providing military facilities to the US in return for military assistance and training. These agreements became a source of friction in the relations of Greece with the US because of their extraterritorial provisions and the disparity in the quantity and quality of aid going to Greece in contrast to Turkey. This became a serious issue as problems arose between Greece and Turkey after 1955 because of the struggle for Cypriot independence and the problems created after 1963 following the collapse of the Cyprus independence agreements. Uh, in the interest of time, I can only touch on a few significant developments in bilateral relations. The Cypriot 1955 uprising against Britain brought Turkey into the picture and had a serious impact on the relations of Greece with the US and NATO. 
1955 Istanbul pogrom against the Greek minority created serious friction between Athens and Washington. John Foster Dulles blamed communists for the pogrom and called on Greece and Turkey to quote, mend their fences in the interest of NATO's cohesion. This was a rude awakening for Greek foreign policy. Moreover, Washington was opposed to the Greek appeals to the United Nations on behalf of Cyprus. It became clear that alliance cohesion and not the rule of law was Washington, Washington's policy priority. The 1959 London and Zurich agreements on Cyprus may have come as a relief to Washington. However, the short-term relief came to an abrupt end late in 1963 with the problems that arose in the implementation of the independence agreements in Cyprus. The threat of a Greek-Turkish conflict and the impact on NATO at the height of the Cold War instigated a variety of American diplomatic interventions, first by, by George Ball, then by Dean Acheson, and of course, President Johnson. Greek-Turkish conflict was averted with Johnson's 1964 ultimatum to Turkey. However, Johnson's action was not a disagreement with Turkey's objectives in Cyprus, but a disagreement over tactics that risked NATO solidarity and a possible Soviet involvement. This became clear with Acheson's mediation on Cyprus and the three plans he presented on Cyprus in the summer and fall of 1964. Once again, Washington placed alliance interests above the rule of law and human rights. Athens experienced domestic pressures for the reassessment of Greek foreign policy, and, but this reassessment never took place because of the political instability in Greece during the mid 60s that culminated in the coup of April 21, 1967. The coup in Athens raised questions about how much the United States knew in advance before the coup and about the possible involvement in the United States in the coup. Moreover, support extended to the junta by Washington, particularly by Vice President Agnew, and the new home, and the new home porting facilities acquired by the US Navy in Greece during the junta clearly undermined the US image in Greece. The junta's 1974 coup in Cyprus brought the next major crisis in Greek-US relations. Washington, of course, was in the midst of the Watergate crisis. Henry Kissinger managed single-handedly the crisis on, Sun on, on Cyprus. He did not interfere with the Turkish invasion, reverting to calls for a negotiated settlement and a peaceful political transition in Greece following the collapse of the junta. The twin crisis in Greece and Cyprus finally awakened the Greek-American community. For the first time in its history, this so-called loyal community rose against the policies of its own government. This rule of law mobilization organized by Jean Rosidis resulted in a temporary arms embargo on Turkey to the great disappointment and regret of the administration. Greece went through a major political transition with the restoration of democracy in Greece under Prime Minister Karamanlis and new political forces that emerged in Athens following the collapse of the junta. These forces agreed on the need for a so-called independent Greek foreign policy something that became easier with Greece joining the European community and the lessening of Cold War tensions. There were, there, there were calls for the closing of American bases in Greece and a compromise ultimately was achieved during the Papandreou administration on the status and number of American bases in Greece. Prime Minister Karamanlis, under the pressure of the Cyprus crisis, took Greece out of NATO's military wing. Politically, it was a necessary decision. However, 
it proved to be a costly decision to Greece in the long term because Greece later on opened negotiations to return to NATO's military wing. And of course, it had to make new compromises to overcome Turkey's veto. Greek-Turkish relations have been the dominant security issue in post-Junta Greece. Greek governments had to accommodate domestic pressures to limit American influence in Greek affairs. This created occasional tensions in the relations of the US with Greece, especially in the early days of the first Papandreou administration, resulting, as you probably remember, in the first American sanctions on the Athens International Airport. At the end, pragmatism prevailed on both sides. Thanks to Greek hands, like ambassadors Stearns and Keeley, and their advice to Washington about Papandreou, that saved the day somewhat. Papandreou, they kept advising that Papandreou, really, you should not watch what he says, watch what he does. Now, relations between Athens and Washington were stabilized, have stabilized since then. Bilateral military and political cooperation has expanded. Most US military facilities in Greece have been consolidated on Crete and in central Greece. Today, Greece remains an anchor of American policy in the Eastern Mediterranean. Problems continue to plague US relations with Greece over the American response to Turkey's revisionism in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean and Cyprus. Washington, much as in previous years, has downplayed Turkey's violations of international law. At moments of crisis, like the 1996 crisis over EMEA, Holbrook's mediation averted the Greco-Turkish war. However, his constructive ambiguity solution helped legitimate, legitimize Turkey's claims of gray areas in the Aegean. Turkey's revisionism will continue to trouble relations of the United States and Greece in the years to come. The new administration in Washington is quite familiar with Turkey's actions and motives in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. We as Greek Americans ought to remain committed to, the, to the, the close political, cultural, and historical ties between our two countries. But we also ought to insist that the rule of law was and is the only way of strengthening our bilateral relations with Greece and Cyprus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kukudakis. Your presentation brought us to today's challenges. <laughs> I would like to ask to thank all the three panelists for the wonderful papers that shed so much light on the topic of United States and the Greek War of Independence. So I, I may ask the first question from the last presentation. And uh, my question is based on the historical account that you have presented and the present situation. How do you anticipate the future US policies regarding Greek-Turkish relations? Well, again, as I said, the, in my opinion, <coughs> unless Washington is willing to deal with what is happening in the Eastern Mediterranean, and that includes the Aegean and Cyprus, the kind of revisionist activities that we're afraid to touch on, both for legal and political reasons, the problems are going to continue. Again, Biden, we know his record from his long service in the Senate. He knows Turkey. The question is whether we'll be willing to stand up for the principles that we have about the rule of law, or are we going to allow a bully like Mr. Erdogan in Ankara to dictate what's gonna be done and how in Greece, in Cyprus, and the Eastern Mediterranean. It's a challenge for Washington. It's a challenge for the Greek American community because don't forget, 
Turkey has invested a lot of money in lobbying in Washington. And if you follow the Turkish lobbying activities today, you keep hearing continuously about how neglected Turkey is, how important Turkey is, and there is hardly any kind of presence other than what the American Hellenic Institute has been doing in recent years to try to present the reality of the power balance in the Mediterranean and who serves U.S. interests better. Yeah, it's like you have concluded your remarks with the rule of law. And earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that human rights are subordinated to economical interests. Yes. And that, that's the sad thing. And the question- It has been, it has been all along. All along. And the question is, and the challenge, if we can see a change about that prioritization- It depends on the Greek American community. It depends on the efforts the Greek, the Greek government is going to be doing separately because we are acting as Americans of Greek descent, believe, believers in the rule of law. The Greek government has to look after its own interests in Washington, hire effective lobbyists in Washington, and invest in promoting the Greek issues in the relations with the United States. I agree with you, and I would add that. Greece is a case, but the, the issue is wider if the rule of law will be implemented or no, because that's not violating the international law is a bad example yes. for other cases as well. And that's what, that's what Jim Rossidis tried to do from day one in 1974. And since then, this is what Nick Larigakis and his staff are doing on a daily basis in Washington, that we have to keep pushing on the issue of the rule of law. Thank you. I believe we all agree on that. And I will continue like with the next question. I will uh, ask my question to Dr. Uh, Santelli. And uh, I would like to ask about like the women's engagement that you very well presented earlier. Uh, do we know more about the social profile of that women? Are women from all ranks? Are women from elites? If it's the latter, we may also uh, assume that the movement of, of romanticism and neoclassicism have also uh, motivated them to be engaged to their uh, charity and benevolent acts towards uh, the Greek cause. Do we know about the profile of that women? Yeah, yes. So um, from what I could find in my research, uh, a lot of the, the women engaged are more from like the middling sort. They'd have to have the, the means to be able to take time out of their day to in, engage in charitable causes. And it did tend to be those were the sorts of women involved in the benevolence movement to begin with. Although um, the interest in the Greek revolution was so widespread. And I mean, I, you know, examples of, and not just within women, but examples of you know, like barber shops donating the proceeds of their earnings of the day to the Greek cause. So, I mean, we, we, we there is definitely a wide ranging uh, base of support where I spoke about women um, devoting time to sewing clothes, for example. A lot of the times that was done through church groups. And so perceivably it could have been uh, women from outside of just the middling sort that were in leadership roles within the church that if they you know, could spend a little bit of time sitting there and sewing a garment, um, it could have had a wider base of interest. Thank you. And definitely it was a religious motivation, as you mentioned, since the church were involved, but also we can assume that it was also the cultural motivation as well about the principles of the Greek War of Independence. Thank you so much. And now we're moving to our first speaker, Dr. Kiru. Um, my question is, to what extent does Korais see ancient democratic Athens through the lenses of the West and why? We, we do see that he's so much 
uh, influenced by the American Constitution, as you very well presented with his like correspondence with Thomas Jefferson, and also his experiences in Europe, studying in Europe, working in Europe. But we also know that another modern Greek philosopher, Rigas Velestin Lys, was much more focused on Hellenism, seeing the, the uh, envisioning the Eliniki Demokratia in his new political administration through the lenses of Hellenism, and that these the autonomous uh, communities in the Ottoman Empire that was vehicles of freedom under the subjugation of the Ottomans. So my question is, um, why Korais has these West lenses in envisioning uh, the establishment of the modern Greek state? Reveal, you raise an intriguing and fundamentally crucial and important question that speaks to uh, both the tensions and the heart of modern Greek identity and contestation over how we understand Greek history, and as a result, how we understand the Greek present. Uh, you invoke the name of Rigas, more popularly known as Rigas Fereos. In a sense, he represents one element of this dichotomy. He's the Romios, if you will, model of the Greek. He's one whose, whose sense of Greek identity is more connected to the more immediate Byzantine past deeply embedded in affinity for orthodoxy and an appeal to uh, not just Greeks as ethnic Greeks, but the larger what Byzantine is called the Byzantine Commonwealth, that is wow. the people who were the uh, inheritors of the Byzantine cultural tradition, the other peoples of the Balkans and the peoples uh, beyond the Greek core of Asia Minor, including the Armenians and Assyrians. Uh, he, he speaks to a more populous, a more folk-oriented, a less intellectualized sense of Greekness. And his view of Greece, Greekness translates into a very different ideological interpretation of a future, what a future Greek state should encompass and how the, uh, those ideals should be articulated. Uh, in the case of Ferreo, excuse me, in, in the case of Corais, Corais, by virtue of his life experiences, in his very unique and extraordinary education, deeply immersed as he was and as his education was in the immediate uh, uh, milieu of the enlightenment was someone who, as I think you were implying, and I, I would agree with you quite accurately if this was your implication, very much almost uncritically internalized this Western imagery construction of classical Greeks and Greeks to superimpose it upon the moderns and to use that as a table to create an imagery for what a future Greece and what a Greek society should look like and of course what it should emulate. And that was his, yes, admittedly very romanticized but also historically informed understanding of the ideals, if not always the realized potential but the ideals of Greek democratic Athens. Um, this also informs where, for example, whereas Korais has an affinity for orthodoxy and the centrality of the church as an institution and as a cultural marker in, Ottoman, in the Ottoman Greek world, this is precisely why, too, Korais harbors considerable enmity toward the established orthodox church, which he sees and interprets uh, as a kind of to use a, 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 a language of, anach of anachronism as a collaborator of Turkish occupation. He, over, he sidesteps, in other words, the Byzantine tradition to emphasize with exclusivity the model of ancient Greece as the source for what should be the inspiration and the model for a future Greece. In that sense, he was also ethnically far more exclusive in terms of imagining a future Greek state, whereas Fereos uh, was far more expansive. He imagined a kind of confederal arrangement of peoples in a post-Ottoman sort of uh, Byzantine-like, but Greek-directed uh, polity of multiple Orthodox Christian peoples. And yes, Korais, uh, understandably, 
was a child of the Enlightenment, and he incorporated into his thinking much of the remarkable ignorance, misunderstanding, and historical amnesia that unfortunately shadowed a lot of Western thinking about the Byzantine and Orthodox periods and influences respectively. Thank you, Dr. Kiru. I agree with you. You uh, received very well my implication. That's exactly what I meant. Because we have here two trajectories, two different trajectories, Hellenism and the West. We could say the freedom of the Greeks and the liberty of the West. Because the West appropriated a classical past in an eclectic way, taking the aesthetic values and the ideals of classical Greece, but completely rejecting democracy in its archetypical like form. Whereas Rigas Vereos, he tries to incorporate the realities of the Greek Kina, which can be seen as an assimilation of the ancient polis, the city-state in the post-Byzantine era in uh, Ottoman Empire and see that as vehicles of freedom under, again, I repeat, Ottoman subjugation, because in this Kina, we have the, the foundational values of collectivity, of solidarity among yes. members of their jurisdiction of electing their own Greek magistrates. And we have a form of self-governance during this 40, 40 for, um, 400 years of subjugation to the Ottoman Empire, we have these vehicles, these islands of freedom in the Greek community, in the post-Byzantine world, which basically are is the shift from the Byzantine world to the uh, 1153 era after the um, fall of Constantinople. So it's surprising how Korais, who is so well educated, who offers this Eliniki Bibliotheki, this wonderful like publication of the ancient Greek authors, wants to ignore this living reality of the Greeks. And as you mentioned, the church, because this Kina, these Greek communities, is also the church of the community, the people who are the polite of the Kinon are also the brothers of the church at the same time. So thank you for your wonderful presentation. And now we have like already uh, questions for you in the Q&A session. So I start with the first, as I see in the uh, Q&A chat box. Professor Dr. Kiru, how Korais as an enlightened scholar deal with within relation to the Byzantine influence on Greek society? So we also commented on that, but if you would like to elaborate more. Sure. Um, Korais, like uh, most Greeks under Ottoman rule, uh, had very little knowledge of the Byzantine past. Uh, he had very little knowledge of anything other than the classical Greek tradition. And that knowledge was largely acquired through Western sources. Greek education had more or less ceased uh, under Ottoman rule. And by the way, uh, Polyvia, not to take issue with your characterization of the condition of the Greek peoples under Ottoman rule, I, I agree in spirit with everything you said, but one point of language, I, I, I would not feel comfortable using the phrase uh, islands of freedom to describe the condition of Greek populations. They were communally structured. There were representative mechanisms and even mechanisms for electing local uh, elders. But if uh, the word freedom is something that I think we cannot associate with this period of the Greek historical experience where under Ottoman rule, we're often told that ethnic communities and religious communities enjoyed autonomy. Uh, they did not actually enjoy autonomy. Autonomy itself suggests a measure of self-governance, principled upon independence or freedom to some measure. That's not the case. It, to the extent that Greeks were able to administer, not govern, but administer themselves, they did so at the behest of the Ottoman authorities so that the Ottoman authorities wouldn't have to. 
uh, and they, they did so only to the extent that their administrations did not conflict with the interests, which were fundamentally extractive and ruling of the Ottoman state. But to go back to the point of uh, uh, Adamandios Coris and his tensions with Byzantium, they were real. He harbored, as I said before, enmity toward the Byzantine tradition, in large part because what he came to understand about Byzantium was taught to him by individuals who labored under a gross prejudice vis-a-vis -vis Byzantium itself. There was very little understanding of Byzantium as a culture and as a polity in Enlightenment Europe. Frankly, it's only beginning in the 20th century that we see some real engagement with the realities of the Byzantine experience in the West. Uh, and and uh, Coriz had internalized this learning. You know, the, the great multi-volume history of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon was the great source for Western understanding of Byzantium. And Coriz was a student of Gibbon's writing. And he was very much influenced by that and the thinking of other Enlightenment uh, writers and philosophers who saw Byzantium as a, a decadent, uh, corrupt, dysfunctional system uh, in, in lieu of uh, a far more dynamic and vibrant system for many, many centuries, which characterized the Byzantine experience. And so these things, um, these things in influenced and informed his drift towards uh, ignoring effectively the most recent, meaning to some extent culturally the most influential periods of Greek history in terms of how they affected the modern condition and emphasize almost exclusively as did his Western friends, the classical experience and the classical imagery and the idealized view of the ancients. Yeah. And thank you. I will continue the next question, but please, since you refer to my comment on the islands of freedom, to give me one minute to defend, like what I said. Sure. First of all, I made clear that we're talking about Ottoman subjugation. The, re the reason I use that phrase is because I believe there is a historical compromise during these 400 years of Ottoman despotism. We have the Ottoman despotism sitting, sitting on the Greek communities that will self-govern inside the community. That's what I meant. That means that the Greeks could elect their Greek representatives. These Greek representatives could distribute the taxation on the community, in the community, according to the, how much each member could afford. They could resolve their issues among themselves. They have their social economical structures in their syndrophies, syndechnies, synaphia. And then the Ottoman despotism, of course, collect heavy taxation, and it's always an arbitrary, tyrannical regime. No question about that. We have the Islamization, we have the pedomazoma, we have all these sufferings. But we need to be aware that the Greeks within these communities, they were able to maintain their conscience that they belong to the Greek nation, their understanding of their heritage and their connection with the Orthodox Church. And this historical compromise also comprises the fact that the patriarchate remained the spiritual leader of Christianity and maintained its privileges in the patriarchate. That was a historical compromise that the Ottoman administration has accepted for their own reasons. Because of course they take advantage of the economical activities of the Greeks, of their skills in diplomacy, their like education and all their contributions. But that's what I meant, like by saying uh, the islands of freedom. We're talking about 400 years of subjugation and despotism. But we need to be aware that Hellenism has this continuity in living in communities and managing their affairs. The Ottomans have not abolished this kina. Actually, the, the Bavarians abolished the kina after the implantation of the absolute monarchy in the body of Hellenism after the War of Independence. But I don't want to 
say more because we need to uh, uh, give the floor to our um, audience. Uh, the second question, I believe, is for Dr. Santelli because it refers to women and says, are any publications by this woman available? So unfortunately, not in the sense that how the question has it has it asked, if there's like a specific volume written by any of these women. And I, I, met, I was unable to really elaborate at length um, what I meant by like benevolence movement, but just very briefly, um, uh, it wasn't socially appropriate for women, even of, of status, to speak publicly on issues that were outside of what historians call the domestic sphere. So the benevolence movement offered this opportunity for women to extend their influence within the home to the community if it had something to do with providing aid to like local orphans or uh, women struggling financially or something like that. So there was already this existing movement before the Greek Revolution began. The Greek Revolution sort of nicely fits in with that scope of the benevolence movement. So it allowed women to enter into the international stage in providing aid to Greeks. Now, in terms of if uh, there is any writings by these women, sadly, again, it wasn't really socially acceptable for women to be authors. Um, but just off the top of my head, um, the person asking the question might look into uh, Lydia Sigourney, who was an American poet and was an advocate for the Philhellenic cause in the United States. There might be some poetry that she wrote on the topic. She certainly wrote in uh, uh, newspaper articles about uh, lending assistance to the cause. Um, another person that you could look into is uh, Emma Willard, who was an advocate for the expansion of female education in the United States, again, predating the uh, Greek Revolution. Uh, she is from New York um, and spoke, uh, well, wrote to the New York State Legislature in the 18 teens about advocating for female education. The Greek Revolution provided her with an international platform to um, expand the scope of female education into Greece, and she assisted with organizing efforts to raise funds and even send teachers to found some of these schools in, um, especially Athens, but in Greece. So uh, Lydia Sigourney and maybe Emma Willard, you could check them out. Thank you so much, Dr. Santelli. And the next question is for uh, Dr. Kufuzakis. Uh, the question is basically a statement that may be asked for your comments or elaboration. Turkish view is that uh, pro President Biden is very pro-Greek. Greece has a strong lobby in USA. Is that view right? <laughs> this is, of course, Turkish imagination at work. Uh, if you compare the millions of dollars that have, have been invested every year by Turkey in American public relations firms, and you compare what Greece and Cyprus are spending in Washington to project Greek issues, the answer is very clear for you right there. Uh, now, the Turkish imagination is extensive. If anybody that disagrees with Turkey is an enemy of the state, pretty much, those who agree are considered to be uh, heroes and friends of Turkey. The reality is that Turkey has acquired a number of supporters from a variety of sources, including the American business community, the American military in years past, particularly because of their extensive service in American military bases in Turkey. But the reality is, in recent years, with Turkey, for example, uh, acquiring Russian military systems and things of this type, the prestige of Turkey has gone down considerably in Washington, they're trying to correct that by blaming that Biden is pro-Greek or whatever. Biden is a pro 
law and foreign policy advocate. And in that context, he has addressed the Greek and the Cyprus issues throughout his service in uh, Washington. And at the same time, the people that, he, that are staffing today, the State Department, National Security Council, and people like that, are people who are very familiar with the issues that are affecting U.S.-Greek relations and U.S. relations with Cyprus. Uh, don't listen to propaganda. I believe you very well said that uh, the president of the United States is pro-law rather than pro-Greece, and this is how everyone should be. Exactly. Thank you. Next question is by Mrs. Magdalene Gandarjis. It's a statement and question, and I think that it's for all of you. Had it not been for the West and philodenism, the Greek revolution would not have succeeded. What do you think? Let's start from Dr. Kuhl. Uh, how does one respond to such a pronouncement, I'm not quite sure, but I'd begin by saying the following. If we're looking for uh, individual external parties to be identified as decisive actors and contributing to Greece's independence, before the Western Philhellenes themselves, I think it's important to point to Imperial Russia. Imperial Russia uh, and its uh, humanitarian in particular and other Philhellenic involvements in the revolution has been much ignored in Western scholarship. In some ways it was more uh, decisive and expansive uh, and it was certainly far more ambitious than was the intervention of Western Philhellenes. They were driven by the same values, but added to those values uh, was the very strong sense of Orthodox Christian identification. And furthermore, it's crucial to point out that Russia's war launched against the Ottoman Empire in 1827 and 1828, subsequent to the clash at Navarino, is ultimately what changed the military balance in the Balkans and forced, along with the decisive, unwilling, but ultimately necessary involvement of the French and British to bring about a negotiated solution to the revolution, which produced an independent, much be a truncated, but nonetheless independent Greek state. So the Phil Philhellenes of the West played, it, played a very decisive role. Uh, I, it's pure conjecture to imagine how the course of the conflict would have proceeded without their involvement. All external actors were uh, decisive factors. Um, this is just my way of saying we need to study Russia uh, more aggressively and its role in the, uh, in, in the Philhellenic movement. Yes, thank you. To add to the role of Russia, like the Treaty of Andronopol in 1829, Article 10 was the one that forced the Ottoman Empire to accept the solution of the Greek question, because before that, the Ottomans did not like negotiate anything. So it's true that the intervention of the powers like resolved the Greek question, but as, as it was said before, it was not just the Philelines or just the West. We have to see the entire image about this war of independence because without this like self-denial and this uh, sacrifice, we couldn't have had any result. Uh, but I would like also the other speakers to give their input on that question, uh, Dr. Uh, Santelli. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just echo similar sentiments. I mean, it's it's so hard to say. I mean, historians don't really dabble in uh, counter history or, or, or what might have been. Um, but based on my research and uh, just the, the the writings of the Philhellenes and and what they're reporting back from Greece, at the very least, it would seem the uh, Philhellenic support aided in boosting morale. At the very least. Um, and again, you know, you can quibble about to what extent it actually assisted with uh, military successes and whatnot um, on a on the larger scale. But certainly, um, in terms of morale, um, I, I, I think that morale does uh, have an important part to play in the success of a revolution, as as much as military assistance provides. Thank you, Professor Kutudakis. Nothing more to add. I think my colleagues have responded very accurately. Yes, and 
I would say that, of course, we know the role of the uh, great powers, uh, Great Britain, France, and Russia to the conclusion of the Greek War of Independence. But we need to keep in mind that it was one small nation at that time having, as we said before, in the beginning, a hostile Europe of the Holy Alliance. No army, no army, and like very few resources. And then at a certain point, some kind of intervention was required because we have like a nation fighting an entire empire that has resources from Egypt, their own military. And I believe that it was reasonable like the powers to be involved. Of course, they played their role, and we see that in the outcome of the Greek War of Independence, that they appear as the protective powers, and basically, they ordain the final solution of the uh, absolute monarchy uh, and the Bavarian king. So the, the outcome says everything, I believe, uh, to that question. But it has happened in a variety of situations in the history of Greece. Look at what happened at the end of 1944, following the liberation of Greece from the Germans, the civil war, the, the mini civil war that Greece went through. At the end, the issues were settled by outside powers, not necessarily by Greeks themselves. Exactly. So outside powers have always had a major influence in the total outcome of all these issues that we have been talking about. Definitely. Uh, there is a question from uh, an anonymous attendee. Uh, Dr. Kufudakis, thank you for your great insight. As it pertains to lobbying efforts by Turkey, due to the grassroots efforts of the American lobby last year, uh, excuse me, Arme Armenian lobby last year, most lobbying firms have dropped Turkey as a client. Do you think this represents a significant change? I'm sorry, uh, what, okay. what, about, what about what lobbying firms? Yes, it says, uh, as it pertains to lobbying efforts by Turkey due yes. to grassroots efforts of the Armenian lobby last year, most lobbying firms have dropped Turkey as a client. Do you think this represents a significant change? Uh, number one, that question ought to be sent to Nikola Rigakis. He can tell you more about that. Uh, does it represent a change? No. Thank you. And the other question, the Russians were the last to enter the naval battle at Navarino as they did that after the naval battle was decided. So that's a comment maybe about the role of Russia that we mentioned before. Does anyone want to elaborate more on the role of Russia? I, I don't have any expertise when it comes to the uh, uh, tactical uh, direction of the Battle of Navarino. Uh, however, I think it's worth pointing out that it was among the great powers, the Russians who first expressed an interest in, in the revolution. Uh, as both, as, as Maureen pointed out, as Van noted, uh, Bolivia, as you said so expertly, the great powers were very much opposed to uh, the uh, radical revolution that the Greeks had inaugurated, which completely and totally upset the entire European concert system after the tumult of the Napoleonic Wars. This was the great pivotal international crisis of the first half of the 19th century in Europe after the defeat of Napoleon. Uh, the Russians found themselves in a very difficult position in as much as the Russian people, as a people, more than any other uh, European or North American people were enthusiastic supporters of the revolution. We, we should remember too that the Filiki at the Rio was first organized in Odessa in Russia, that its first uh, revolutionary bands crossed the border from Russia into the Danubian principalities to launch the revolution, that enormous relief committees, far larger than the ones that 
uh, Maureen talked about with, uh, with a, a great description, uh, like those in the West were established in Russia. The Russians went to great lengths to liberate 100,000 Greeks who had been enslaved and sold in markets across the Ottoman Empire, slave markets. So it's, it's common for us to always react in a knee-jerk fashion about Russia in the West. But Russia in 1821 through 1830 was not the same state that we typically associate with Russia today. In its relationship with the Orthodox world and the Greek world and its involvement in, um, in, in, in the revolution, I think uh, should not be understood from a decidedly presentist perspective. Um, Ru the Russian units at the Battle of Navarino might, might have entered the engagement as the last force to do so, but it's the Russian army, the only European army to go to war against the Ottoman Empire and to reach the outskirts of Constantinople, which Bolivia, as you rightly pointed out, forced the Ottomans to accept the ultimate independence of the Greek state. So I think it's important for us to uh, kind of engage Russia in, in a balanced way. And if we do that, we'll see that, again, as I said before, it's important for us to study more about the critical role that the Russians played in the revolution as Phil Helene's in their own right. Thank you. We have another comment about Russia by an anonymous attendee. Uh, with all respect, I will disagree with the assessment that the Russians offer more than the West. And I would like to say that I agree with what you have just present uh, Professor Kiru, and I would like to add also that uh, Count Kapodistrias, Ioannis Kapodistrias, the first governor of Greece, was one of the three minister of foreign affairs of the Russian Empire in 1821 and before. And he tries to convince the Tsar Alexander I to, to join the Greeks on that uh, war against the Ottoman Empire. And number two, Alexander Sipsilandis, the leader of Filikieteria, was an officer in the Russian army and wrote a letter to Tsar Alexander I himself saying what was of the interest of the Russian Empire to join the Greek Revolution. But under the Holy Alliance spirit, which part was the Russia, Russia, Austria, and Prussia was members of the Holy Alliance that have decided like to, to oppress any revolutionary movement in, in Europe at that time. Under that pressure of Metternich, the Tsar did not engage in helping the Greek War of Independence. Otherwise, he has all the interest because he was in continuous wars against the Ottoman Empire. It was a Christian empire. So they have all the, all the reasons to support the Greek uh, War of Independence. Uh, let's move to another question now for Dr. Santelli. I live in Baltimore, which has had a large and active Greek community from the early 20th century. There is even an area of the city that called Greek town. You mentioned the women of Baltimore raised funds and supported the Greek cause. Do you have any suggestions of where I could find more information about who these women were? Sources? So my sources were primarily from newspapers of the time. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not sure if like just doing a simple Google search, you would find like these articles or pamphlets. It's possible. Um, I mean, you can always check out my book, <laughs> which provides like footnotes, of course, on, on some of these sources. Um, but um, unfortunately, a lot of my sources were just these articles put out for public consumption. The um, fair that I mentioned, for example, um, was just one event among lots of events actually held in Baltimore organized by these by these women. So um, sadly, there isn't like one book that I can point you towards to, to read all about um, the involvement. And frankly, a lot of the, the involvement of the women in Baltimore and elsewhere was really grassroots um, and, uh, and was sustained by a, a general public um, interest in the, the Greek cause. Thanks. It may be a good idea to take a look at Stephen Larrabee's book. He covers quite a bit of the about the different movements across the US, men, women, 
and how they went about supporting the, the Greek Revolution. And I think to me, one of the more significant uh, things about the about Larabi's historical account of the of the of the Greek Revolution is the fact that he shows that the support that came from the U.S. was truly nationwide. It was not just New York or Baltimore. It was across the board, across the different states, and there you may find a variety of small material from footnotes and things like that. Olivia, might, might I add, since we're developing a reading list here, <laughs> along with uh, Van's mention of uh, Larrabee's very important book, uh, to speak to the interests of some of the uh, questioners earlier, there's a very important and brilliantly documented book written by Theodore Prusis, which was published about two decades ago, uh, entitled uh, Russia and the Greek Revolution that speaks to some of the issues we were addressing earlier. He, uh, as a, a prelude to that book, he also published a very important article on the same subject in Modern Greek Studies Yearbook in the late 1980s. Those are two sources that, if people are interested, might consult uh, to look at the Russian dimension of Philhellenism. Thank you for that. That's very helpful. And uh, Professor Kufudakis, it's very important to learn that this was across the country. Yes. We may assume that the, the uh, nation's capital has this neoclassical like profile, the buildings, the culture, the intellectuals, the founding fathers, but to learn that it was like a nationwide effort, that, that means a lot. That, that is, again, one of the things missing from the discussion, because it was not just New York that had, or Boston that had the larger Greek presence, societies and all. You go to rural areas in Kentucky, you go to rural areas in Ohio and things like, and places like that. And it's amazing to see how they were involved in collecting money, clothing, supplies that they could send to Greece and so on. So it was truly a nationwide activity. It was not just an East Coast activity. This is something I actually take up in my book. I look at the national outpouring of the Philhellenic movement. Um, and indeed, it, it was nationwide. Um, unfortunately, for whatever reason, in fact, Southerners lamented their inability to organize at a large level like New York or Boston. Um, but I, I went to a number of archives uh, in Philadelphia, New York, for example, and there are you know, thousands of receipts that these archives have showing uh, donations from individuals. And some of them are accompanied by letters where they talk about uh, their efforts on the local level to try and organize for the Greeks. And um, I, I, because the South was more rural than uh, Northern states, um, they, they tended to send their donations to New York. New York was recognized as the central collection point for the Philhellenic movement in the United States. But they still would say, you know, we're so disappointed that we can't organize on a large scale, you know, here in Kentucky, for example, although, uh, as you say, that I think it was, it was a college in particular in Kentucky that um, tried to organize efforts for the Greeks. Um, but you know, like in Virginia and farther south, um, they tended to send their donations to New York. Olivia, a very visible legacy of this national phenomena that, that Van and Maureen were just talking about is, is evident if you look at place names of communities that were established and or incorporated in the 1870s. In Michigan. Exactly, Van. The most preeminent, of course, is Ypsilanti, Michigan. Why would the people of Michigan name their town Ypsilanti? Because Ypsilanti was a remarkably in, in re revered figure in the 1820s. And communities that were settled in uh, upstate New York, uh, Lake Erie area region of Pennsylvania, and the old Northwest territories, the upper Midwest, uh, are dotted with Athens, Adelphi, Greece, Macedonia, Corinth. They all emerged in more or less the same time, the 1820s and 1830s, because of what was a national cause celeb, 
the Greek Revolution. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a comment from Mrs. Calliope Tufidi. I would like to congratulate all of you for this wonderful and lighting presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Tufidi, for your kind words. And then we have another question. Uh, do close relations by with Putin and Erdogan affect Russian look to Greece? I'm sorry, would you repeat that again? Yes. Do close relations by with Putin and Erdogan effect, affect Russian look to Greece? Well, look, the Erdogan and Putin right now have developed a particular relationship that may reflect both their frustration with Washington and other broader regional type issues. But the reality today is that Russia and Turkey have common interests for a variety of reasons. That's why they're, co they're cooperating in some aspects of the Middle East problem. They're also fighting each other in Syria. So let's not make too much out of these shady relationships, the, um, the military weapons that have been sold, particularly the S-400s that have been sold by Russia to Turkey, not only have a strategic connection, but also have an economic connection. And it's a way for Russia to get into NATO, to undermine relations within NATO, in the, with, with the United States and so on, but take all, a lot of that stuff with a big grain of salt. Thank you. Uh, th there is a comment for Dr. Santelli about her book. They are looking forward to read the book. And yeah. then there is another question by anonymous attendee. How about Thessaloniki in Macedonia and the efforts there to try and revolt and why it failed? Well, with, with respect to the revolution uh, beyond uh, the Peloponnesus and Rumeli, there was a revolution. Uh, there was a revolution in Cyprus. There was a revolution uh, across the islands. There was a revolution in Crete, in Epiros, in Thessaly, in Macedonia, even in remote parts of Thrace. So much of the Greek world outside Ionia and um, the rest of Asia Minor uh, did revolt. And uh, the people of Thessaloniki, like most urban populations, were made victims before there was any opportunity for them to revolt. Uh, a revolt took place in the early stages of the revolution that liberated most of the Chalcidice, Chalkidiki. There was a revolt not far from Thessaloniki to the west. Veria Naosa formed a strong cornerstone of opposition to Ottoman rule and quickly liberated themselves. In Thessaloniki, though, what we saw was, well, unfortunately, much like what we saw in Constantinople, Smyrna, and in other urban centers, uh, the Ottoman authorities and Muslim populations took out their frustrations and rage on hapless, unarmed civilian populations, which hadn't engaged in rebellion, which were simply trying to live their lives unmolested. Uh, several thousands of, uh, of uh, uh, ethnic Greeks in Thessaloniki were put to the sword uh, and um, thousands of people lost their lives in Thessaloniki. Uh, so a revolt, a physical revolt did not take place in Thessaloniki, but the consequences of the effort for Greeks elsewhere to liberate themselves were translated into, um, into atrocities committed against the population of Thessaloniki. Same, same. same thing happened in Cyprus where Turkey, Ottoman Turkey took preemptive action, uh, killing the leadership of the, Cypri the Greek Cypriot community, just in case they decided to also uh, rebel against the Ottoman Empire. And, and in Crete, the same. And actually, as you mentioned, Dr. Hill, the missionary that founded the Hill School for Girls in Plaka. And this was the mentor 
of the author of the volume I brought into light, Classical Bouquet. It was Elisabeth Kondaksaki, a refugee girl from Crete to Syros, that went to Dr. Hill School and he learned Latin, ancient Greek, English, French, and she was an extraordinary woman of that time, like speaking all this language and the uh, ambassador of Great Britain hired her to the embassy of Great Britain in Athens. And now like we have gi given the floor to everyone uh, in the audience. Uh, we address all the questions. I would like to thank you all for your wonderful presentations that said so much light on our topic, United States and the Greek War of Independence. And now I would like to turn the floor to the president of American Hellenic Institute, Nin Larigakis, for his uh, conclusion remarks. Thank you all. Well, since I'm the president, I have a lot of latitude, so I have some questions. <laughs> so we're not done yet. Uh, Dr. Uh, Farara, thank you so much for uh, your wonderful job of presenting and moving the discussion forward. And uh, I was a little concerned when we ended, when we ended, if we're going to have enough questions to fill in the time till 3.30, or we might go a little bit over. Very quickly, and mine are not profound or based on any professorial sort of background or anything. Vanko Fadakis, I'm going to ask the question to each one of you and then answer them at the end. Vanko Fadakis, uh, today United States and the United Kingdom are the best of friends. Uh, France and Germany arguably are, are close friends, as so is France and, and the UK. Is there any other arch rivals in the world today, okay, who fought for independence and still have tense relations as Greece and Turkey has today? Uh, uh, Alexander, uh, Jefferson's response to Corais, and I apologize if maybe I didn't, you may have mentioned it, I didn't hear it, I don't understand the complete historical context of the time, when he said, you know, the Washingtonian uh, response in his farewell address about don't get entangled in European affairs, uh, I assume that's where it comes from to a certain degree. But even if the United States at that time wanted to intervene militarily, did even, did even have the capacity to do so, and it was a little bit more into that comment than just what it was. Uh, Professor Santelli, these committees, what was the makeup of these committees? Uh, who were the, what were the individual, you know, the makeup of the individuals who made up these, these Boston committees, these Philadelphia committees, these New York committees? And what was the time period that was the apex of when they were mobilized and, and, and assisted in, in his various uh, philanthropic ways, uh, Greece. Whoever wants to go first. Um, I, I could uh, answer the question you uh, sent my way. Um, generally speaking, those who took up leadership positions um, within these uh, the Philhellenic organizations tended tended to be elite men of status. Um, and then women later on would form auxiliary groups. Some of these men were um, very important individuals who would go on to uh, serve in important capacities in, in politics and what have you. Um, for example, and I'm, his first name's escaping me, but uh, Dallas of, uh, of Philadelphia ends up becoming vice president later on. Um, so they, they, they tended to be of high status, and then they used that status to garner support from the public. And then in terms of those who uh, would donate, I, I found evidence to suggest people of all levels of society provided donations, however small that they could provide. Uh, for example, um, a fire brigade from Washington City donated funds that they collected. Again, I think I mentioned earlier, but uh, a barber uh, devoted all of his uh, uh, takings from one day of work to the Greek cause. So it's elite men, but it's also even uh, you know down to the lowest rung of society expressed interest. And I could also uh, speak a little bit to the question that you uh, uh, sent uh, Dr. Kiro's way, but um, I'll, I'll let him talk. And then it's it's a topic that I take up about uh, the American. Uh, support for the Greek uh, in Greek revolution and, and why they did not end up sending aid. Marina, he, I, Marina I'm going to obtain your book because I want the answer to that question. But <laughs> Nick, to, to answer the questions you put forward, 
When Corais wrote to Jefferson and asked for his support, it was not with any expectation that the United States would send its then paltry armed forces to liberate the Greeks themselves, but he did want some things from the United States. And those things that Corais asked for were essentially the same things that uh, really the, the wide array of Greek committees and Phil Hellenes in the United States were calling on the American government to provide for the cause. Uh, not the least among them was recognition of the provisional revolutionary Greek government. That sort of diplomatic recognition would have meant a great deal for the Greek cause and it would have been tangible. Uh, President Monroe, who expressed the desire that the Greeks liberate himself, also noted that the United States was committed to an official policy of neutrality. And yes, he invoked, as you did too, the message that Washington left the country, that the United States should remain a neutral power vis-a-vis -vis the European powers. Well, while Monroe expressed this, his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, was engaged in, in secret negotiations with the Ottoman government to protect American com already established commercial interests in the Ottoman Empire, to expand them, and more than anything else, to protect as sordid as this is, and this becomes a common theme in American-Turkish relations, he was committed to protecting the very lucrative opium trade that American ship owners dominated in the link between China and the Ottoman Empire. The British commanded the link between South Asia and, and, and China, but it was the Americans who controlled the opium trade between the Ottoman Empire and China. And that's what drove opposition to any kind of tilt toward Greece. So what we see, to use Kissinger's language instead, is a tilt towards the Ottoman Empire. Um, and by the way, uh, to your point of, well, what could, have the United, what could have the United States done in some tangible way? Uh, the United States could have done a great deal uh, there already existed the precedent and the, um, the means for the United States to project power. It's no accident that it was to Jefferson that Corais made his appeal for all the reasons I discussed, but for one other. Jefferson had been the president of the United States when the United States became involved in its first, albeit undeclared, real war in the old world. And that war was fought against the Bar Barbary pirates, as they're often discussed in American historiography, but as people understood them then, as vassals of the Ottoman Empire. America's first war was fought, in effect, against the Ottoman Empire. And with that precedent, Corais understood that Jefferson might be someone who would be receptive to appeals to do for Greece what the United States had done for itself in the Mediterranean in the not too distant past. Man. Over the years, Nick, I have heard from American diplomats and others why Greece and Turkey don't do what the French and the Germans did with their reconciliation after World War II. The answer for that is very simple. The German-French reconciliation after of World War II were signed and ratified, after the Nuremberg Tribunal decisions were implemented, and then intellectuals and political figures from Western Europe who believed in the, in the dream of a united Europe came together and put the pieces together for the next step. But again, I emphasize First, we had peace treaties that were implemented. We had judicial judgments that were implemented. Today, we have the Turkish army in Cyprus, still there since 1974. Turkey refuses to implement or accept any of its responsibility for what took place in Cyprus, for example. So until some of these things happen, reconciliation is not going to be very easy. Well, that wasn't exactly my, my question. Is, is there any other countries anywhere else in the world who, who have still animosity towards each other, for lack of a better word, like Greece and Turkey have today, who at one point got independence from one another? Or is this still an ongoing issue 200 years later to a certain degree? Is, is Pakistan and India, how long have they been at it? <laughs> well, Pakistan and India, 
countries in Africa and on and on. Uh, each, each conflict situation has its own dynamic. And I don't think we can compare what happened, say, as I said, in Europe, for example, at the end of World War II, with what is happening when you have leaders in Turkey unwilling to recognize and deal and address their historical past and what they have done. Very good. A few more points and we'll wrap it up. You know, as we were talking here, I was reminded that in one of my shelves here, I have a book that was given to me by my college professor about 30 years ago as a gift. And the book is The History of Modern Greece, uh, 1827 it was, it was published, out of uh, Nathan Hale Publishing. Uh, so I haven't read this, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm not sure what to do with it. Look, look at the condition it's in. But it's a firsthand account to a certain degree of 1827. It has many chapters on, obviously, uh, the Greek War of Independence. Uh, if anyone is interested, I may try to make some photocopies of this and to provide it uh, for purposes of might be some useful uh, information. The Greek lobby. We are not a Greek lobby. We at the American Hellenic Institute and Americans who advocate for issues regarding the Eastern Mediterranean, we do it as, as American citizens on behalf of what is in the best interest of the United States. So it is a complete misnomer to ever associate what Greek Americans do in the United States and organizations as a Greek lobby. At best, we are an agree, uh, we're a Greek American lobby if we have to go somewhere within the ethnic title. So that's a huge difference. The Greek lobby is that that which the Greek government will eventually uh, and, and it has at different times, retained on K Street to do its lobbying. Turkey has diminished its lobbying uh, payroll over the years, and most recently in the last couple of years. But it's important to note that only just recently, about a month ago, they retained one of the leading lobbying firms in Washington by the name of Arnold and Porter for $750,000 for a six-month period to specifically help them to try to get back on the F-35 program, the Joint Strike Fighter, the next generation of a uh, 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 fighter plane, uh, which Turkey has been frozen out of because of its S-400 purchase from, from uh, uh, Russia. And of course, the, the sanctions that have been imposed under the CATSA uh, rules uh, by the Congress in, in late uh, uh, 2020. Relations are not good with, with, with Turkey today because of the way Erdogan has been maneuvering through his blue homeland policy, uh, his, his coziness with Iran, uh, his anti-Israeli uh, rhetoric. Uh, he's got basically no friends anywhere in the region for the most part, and he continues to be about as provocative and aggressive regarding Greece and Cyprus and the entire region as Turkey has ever, uh, unfortunately, per perpetrated throughout its history. Anthony Blinken, in his confirmation hearings, said the following. So Turkey is an ally, but doesn't act like an ally. And that's a direct quote. The president of the United States and every US policy uh, enforcer on US policy is always going to base it on interest. It's, it has nothing to do other than interests. I like to think, though, values have something to do as well. And when it comes to values, the United States and Greece and Cyprus, in my ad, do share in those common values of, of the Western world. So we'll see how this whole thing plays out. That's what we do here at the American Hellenic Institute. Uh, we're under any illusions. Uh, the war continues and uh, Greece fought a very bitter war uh, of independence. They fought amongst themselves. They fought against the Ottoman Empire. It was ugly as all wars of independence, unfortunately, uh, uh, end up being. But in the end, with the help of Phil Hellenes through, uh, through Europe and with the assistance of a philanthropic help from the United States, they were able to achieve, okay, their independence in 1821, which ultimately did not happen almost until we know the Greek borders today over a hundred years later. But it, again, Greece, history repeats itself. It was occupied again during the Germans. There were civil wars and yes, there was famine and America came to its aid again during World War II when the War of Ahepa uh, and, 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 and uniting and mobilizing the, lead, the, the elite of Hollywood mostly 
were able to provide much needed war relief effort for the starvation that was happening in Greece in the middle of World War II. So history, unfortunately, does repeat itself. And it does repeat itself until now in that we still, as Van said, we still have an occupation uh, in Cyprus, not Greece, but it's Cyprus. It's a, it's, a Hellenic, it's a Hellenic country in the sense of, you know, its, it's character. There's an occupation force there and a, and a siege on, on Greece itself by Turkey today by virtue of its provocative actions in the form of overflights and interventions into its territory in the air and in the sea and challenges to the Treaty of Luzon that identify Greece's boundaries today. So the work continues. Let's not make no mistake about it. But nonetheless, Greek, Greece retained its freedom and we're here today enjoying this freedom and having this discussion because of what they did 200 years ago today. And uh, Professor Santelli, I hope as the Greek government now is looking to upgrade its naval fleet and on their shopping list are four frigates. And I know the United States will be looking to uh, promote its brand of four frigates. If they do go do you know, during the course of American frigates, we don't have the repeat of what happened with the frigates <laughs> in, in the 1820s. So once again, I'd like to thank all and each of you from yesterday's speakers, today's speakers. I think this was a tremendous conference that we were able to put together here of diverse topics. Uh, I'd like to thank the moderator today, Lily Polaraf, for doing an excellent job. As always, I'd like to thank our, our, our staff, Elias Yerasoulis, Emily Pandas, who acts as our producer today, Yola Pakchanian, and of course, uh, all the sponsors who helped make programs like this possible here at the American Clinic Institute. So from all of us, we wish you uh, all a good afternoon. And next week on the 25th, we hope, we wish everyone a happy Greek Independence Day, 200 years. And we are not done with our, 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 our salute to Greek Independence Day here at the American Hellenic Institute. As on April 14th, as we do every year on Capitol Hill, this year virtually, we will do our annual congressional salute to Greek Independence Day on April 14th, and look for that invitation soon in your email boxes. So from all of us, again, thank you very much. Wishing everyone a good afternoon, and thanks once again to all our speakers. Thank you again. Thank you, Nick. Miss you, Van. Thank